my name is Alina Siegfried. Um, I've been the author recently of a series called Our Regenerative Future, which is co-produced by Pure Advantage and the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. Um, it started out as a content series of, um, of stories of the people that are at the forefront of regenerative agriculture in New Zealand. Um, and so this web series that we're running now is an extension of that. Um, an opportunity for you all to ask questions um, of the people. And tonight our session is on walking the talk. So we're, um, we're speaking with four of the farmers that are actually um, leading, leading the work here in New Zealand um, on the ground at the moment. Um, you'll see in the bottom uh, bar, you've got a little Q&A box. That is the place to please put any questions that you have for the speakers. Um, and I'll be asking those questions live as we go through the session. Um, some of you have also um, asked some questions when you registered, so we'll try to get to some of those as well. We do have um, a, lot of, a lot of questions coming through. Um, we found with the last webinar we couldn't answer them all. So we'll do our best to try and get through as many as we can. Um, and also um, know that we might um, ask the questions in the next webinar series. We've got at least four more of these coming up. Um, or we might be taking those discussions online onto social media in the coming weeks to try and get a bit of a conversation going there when we don't have time here. Um, you will see a, um, a poll coming up very soon, which we'd love you to please um, just take a moment to fill out. Um, it's just multi-choice. It gives us an idea of who is on the call, um, just so we can get an idea of how to... Um, how to frame the discussion today. So that should have come up for you now, that poll. I can see people are starting to um, engage in there. And you can also upvote the questions. So if you see a question in the Q&A box that you would also like answered, um, by all means, give it, a, give it an upvote. And that'll help us um, know what kind of things people would like to know about from our panelists. I'm gonna introduce them very soon. Uh, but just to give you a quick background, um, I see, as I said, this is a, um, a series that we've done with Pure Advantage and EHF, which is the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. Um, it started out as, um, as EHF were looking to showcase a few of their fellows that are involved in regenerative agriculture. Um, and we discovered that Pure Advantage were also looking to um, look at um, soil carbon through the lens of regenerative agriculture. So there seemed to be quite a bit of overlap there. And we um, got talking and um, ma made a bit of a partnership to start this series. Um, so Edmund Hillary Fellowship, I'll just do a quick shout out. They've got applications open right now for cohort six. Um, it's a wonderful global community of entrepreneurs, um, farmers, change makers, um, artists, different innovators who are all um, trying to make positive global impact. Their applications for cohort eight are closing on the 1st of June. And as I understand it, it's the final opportunity to apply for a global impact visa for those of you who are calling from overseas. So check that out. Um, EHF.org is the website there. Um, I can see that mm, we've got about 80% of the people voted in the poll at this point. Um, and about half of you all are farmers and growers, which is just fantastic. We've got a few other people from business and media and, and science and academia as well. Um, and good to see that people, most people are, um, have at least read some of the, the stories, which means that you might be familiar with some of our panelists already. Um, okay, I think we will kick into things pretty quickly here. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to um, ask our panelists to briefly introduce themselves. Um, and let's start with, um, with Mark, if you'd like to, to yeah, introduce yourself and tell us what regeneration means to you. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome, public, and the other panelists as well. It's good to be here with a good bunch. Um, so my name's Mark Anderson and I, I myself and my family farm 750 milking cows. Um, we milk once a day in the Warra South catchment area in South Otago. Um, 
So we've identified regenerative farming as a model that presents us uh, the least risk for, for the future um, for our business um, and a lot of other um, issues we face as well. Um, yeah, so the changes we've made and the results we're seeing have left us wanting more. Yeah. And regeneration to me, um, or to us, that um, we, we would love to move beyond sustainable into regeneration. So for us, that means um, regenerating our soils, uh, our animals, our people, the land, um, human health, um, many things, yeah. Wonderful, thank you for that, Mark. Um, should we go on over to Kay? Welcome. We just need to unmute you, Kay. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora, it's an honor to be here um, with all of you. Um, I guess a short, a short, story is I've been an organic gardener for about 50 years and for the last 35 or so outside of like growing the family food and the family farm I've been focused on saving our New Zealand heritage food plants which includes fruit trees as well as heritage vegetable seeds and just as importantly as saving them which has been a huge learning um, is how to learning how to grow them in, in ways that are regenerative of the ecology that they're in. So that's been another huge journey. So I guess for me, um, over the past 15 years since we left Kaiwaka and we've really been here where we are now, the good news is that we've raised the humus levels in the soil, because we're on pumice sand here, from 4% to 25 to 30% in our seed gardens and our food production gardens. And we've raised the bricks of the plants from four to six to 16 to 20 to 25%. And we've been kind of focused on like building the soil and the bricks, but on, on that journey, we've learned so much else. And um, in order to, like Koanga, as well as, for Koanga, as well as saving the food plants and creating regenerative ways of growing them, we've been focused on like sharing that knowledge through our workshops and, through Regeneration Productions now, we're doing online workshops, which have been really successful. But for me, um, if we're going to transform the way that we live on this planet and create a, re a regenerative way of living, um, it needs to be measured by creating personal, community, ecological and economic health and well-being. So I really liked what Sarah Seller said um, in the last session about the importance of creating local food economies that capture value at every possible point and circle them back into local economies. And um, I believe that one of the key, the, like some key things in order to do that are to create regional or bioregional research stations and demonstration centres with working models based on integrated land use design with many which we're going to require many more people on the land and actually changes in land ownership and access models and investment, heaps of investment in all of the above. And I also see, as they discussed last week, that standards are going to be really critical for this because even for education alone, let alone marketing, yeah, so the, and the Koanga Institute is like, that's what we're setting out to, to create is a, that's our job we see and to do, to create a, um, an, a research and um, a model on the ground to inspire and support others. So yeah, that, I kind of see my role in the, in the local, creating local economies area. I know that every, everyone is doing it differently and there's lots of different ways of doing it, but yeah. That's my journey. Wonderful. Thank you, Kay. Um, so fantastic to see such great results from you guys. Um, Simon, would you like to introduce yourself? 
Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Simon Osborne, obviously. Uh, 280 hectares of uh, arable farming just next to Lake Ellesmere, which most people have heard of for its infamy <laughs> around uh, the environmental quality of the lake, which actually isn't quite reported correctly in the media. Uh, it has some peculiarities that don't quite line up with the reports. But anyhow, um, we've been no-till here for 46, 47 years. Um, and when I came back onto the farm in 1992, I thought, well, what do I want to do with my life? Um, and I thought, well, organic farming appealed to me um, because of the, I guess, the philosophy of it. But our soils couldn't withstand that type of treatment um, for cropping, and uh, it was intensive. It was 130 odd years of intensive cultivation. Well, no, not all the time, but that had destroyed them in the first place. So we, we I moved into no-till with full residue retention, reasonably conventional um, for the rest of it, um, using chemical and fertilizer. I think. We improved our soils a little bit. Um, organic matter levels grew, but mostly in the top part of the soil, where the you know with the detritus and uh, because we were retaining all the residue, so we were building a good duff layer in the soil. Um, I think probably it, it's an interesting challenge. I, I, as I got to the 2010s and, and beyond. I sort of thought we weren't seeing enough development in our soils um, and we weren't seeing enough biological activity in our soils, although they're still reasonably good at that point. Um, so I started looking at other ways of, of doing it. And I think overuse of fertiliser has stripped the life out of the soils um, because obviously if plants can achieve nutrients easily, they don't bother well, it's not a matter of not bothering, it's a bit of an oversimplification, but they don't tend to develop those symbiotic relations that, uh, relationships that help them to feed. And those symbiotic relationships uh, with the microbes, fungi and bacteria and other things in the soil are actually what build soil. Um, so by putting, it's just a new way of learning to manage. And I think this is the key for people looking at regenerative agriculture, there's a lot of controversy around it. It's actually not controversial at all in my, in my view. It's a, farming is a scientific endeavour and it's also all about ecology. And building a healthy um, agroecology, ecological system is, is basically the fundamental um, reason for doing it. And it, it's building resilience and building health into the soil. Um, I don't have a purist view, um, and I've come from the world of conservation, what I call conservation agriculture, which sort of has elements of conventional and organic sort of thrown into it. Um, I'm, not, I'm not as scared of, of synthetic inputs as, as many people are. Um, over the years, although, I mean, obviously, I'd rather not use them if we can. And so I guess our endeavour is to try and work, work, work our ways how to, how to reduce and minimise the use of those products and how to reduce the impact that they might have. And I, it, it's been an extraordinary journey of learning. And um, I just love soil ecology. I, I mean, I'm, I'm no academic. Uh, I was pretty bloody useless at school. Um, I could barely read when I left. But, man, I'm learning now. And... Mm. Uh, you know, once you get into the, the twilight part of your 50s, to be still learning like this is great. And um, I'm, I'm just enjoying every minute of it. But I, I, do, I do get concerned uh, with some of the polarisation around the terminology of regenerative agriculture. And I want to see it as an inclusive thing. It's an educational thing. It's an opportunity to learn. It's an opportunity to reconnect and it's an opportunity to rebuild our, our rural communities. And um, so, yeah, I, 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 want to, I want to proceed along those lines. Wonderful. Yeah, we've got um, our next session next Monday at lunchtime is, is diving much deeper into soil ecology with um, Dr. Gwen Grillet from Landcare and with Nicole Masters. So that'll be an exciting session too. Um, thank you, Simon. Um,
finally, Hamish, I'd love to introduce you to briefly uh, invite you to introduce yourself and tell us what regeneration means to you, please. Yeah, my name's Hamish Spelsky. We're just, I don't know, five minutes away from Mark, South Otago, 300 hectares rolling to um, undulating hill country. Um, sheep and beef, we were cropping, um, but that just got too hard, so I left that to Simon. Um, the, <laughs> what I've learned a lot is how uh, grazing with livestock can actually um, really enhance our ecosystems. And, and I'm always trying to think, what's our vision for, um, for our farm and business and life? And, and I think it's, we want things teeming with life. We want soil teeming with life. We want our water teeming with life. We want our animals, our people, and our, and our bank account just teeming with life. And um, so that, that's our aim here. I'm a bit like um, Simon, I'm not a purist. Um, we're definitely on a journey to uh, understanding, I think it's the big key here, regenerative farming is understanding what practices or what management actually de degrades our environment and what practices improve our environment. And you know, four years ago, I, I learned about regenerative agriculture and I was very, very stubborn in wanting to learn. I thought I was actually very sustainable. I mean, I genuinely thought um, what I was doing could last for, for decades, but what I learned is can it last for millennia? You know, that's truly true sustainability is, is your practice not using up non-renewable resources? So that's when I really started. When, the more I learned, the more I realized that winter cropping, for example, and putting sediment into our waterways is not regenerating, it's degrading. Um, that's scientific fact. So I had to work out if I want to do less winter cropping, I needed to grow more grass. How am I going to grow more grass and leave it in pasture 100% of the time? Well, that was learning how to graze my stock better. And so I went and researched um, how to grow more plants, uh, have more growth, but also better animal performance. Because in my four year journey, I have had some big failures in my animal performance by letting the grass grow too long. So as all these synergies were trying to work out, failure, success, failure, success. And I guess in this last year, we've finally cracked with some really good education how to improve animal performance as well as grow more grass and have the need for less winter crops. So it's all starting to come together. Over the last um, six years, we've probably lifted our, our our stocking rate or our, our carrying capacity 25% and we've never looked in a better position to be as profitable as we're going from here going forward. And just what I want to say um, before I go, this is our um, Facebook, Rehoboth Farm. Oh no, that doesn't work at all, does it? Uh, because it's, uh, I need a mirror. Uh, we, could, we could see it, I think. Can yeah. you see that? Does that work? Yep, yep, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, Good so stuff. that's our Facebook. Well, uh, there you go. And, um, and below that is another initiative that is called AgWall, which is um, farmers actually working together to make our own jerseys, socks, clothing, carpets, uh, wool insulation. So it's really exciting where the farmers actually put in our wool bales and we make all these products and the farmer gets a whole lot more money and the customer gets quality woolen products for better value that they can buy on the main market. So there's so many things happening, so exciting. So um, yeah, let's go for it. Great, thank you for that Hamish. You heard it here folks, and Ursula has put those names in the chat window if you'd like to check them out as well. So let's crack into some questions um, now. We've got quite a few coming through in the Q&A box. Um, so, um, one that I'd like to pick out to start with is um, there's a question from Duncan Hum around why mainstream scientists and agricultural commentators claim there's a lack of science behind regenerative agricultural or biological practices. So there seems to be sometimes that disconnect between the scientific world and the world of regen ag. Does anybody want to speak to that? I'll have a go at that if you like. Um, I think 
there's lack of farm systems research. There's no lack of research around individual facets of ecology and soil ecology. And, um, you know, there's, there's just a plethora of research, but I would also then ask the question, well, where's the farm systems research for conventional agriculture? Because it's not there either. Um, it's, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a moot point really. I, I just, there's, there's loads of science around all the elements of regenerative agriculture. You just got to go looking for it. Anybody else like to add anything on that question? Yes, yeah, so can I just add that what we're finding is nature works in holes, patterns and synergies. So when we divide that up into parts, a lot of the science is somewhat based around the parts of the whole. So while we may treat part of the whole, we quite often have unintended consequences from treating a part so we have the unintended consequences on the whole. So, yeah, we need a holistic view of, of science and, and how to approach things. And I think regenerative ag really helps address that. Right, it's, it's a little bit like looking at all of the, the complex moving uh, parts of a farm system in, in terms of silos and, and individual metrics, whereas I think the regenerative agriculture looks at the much more of the whole and the whole functioning of the ecosystem. Um, fantastic. Um, there's a question here and love to hear um, your, your um, comments from the individual panelists, um, but from Alexey um, Malikin, how long does it take for a regenerative farm to begin producing in amounts similar to conventional farms? I'm sure you'll all have different um, experiences with that. We'd love to hear from each of you if you're open to chatting. Um, Hamish, what do, um, what do you think? I know we discussed when we when we had our interview. You trying quite a few different things. Um, the transition is more about the, the understanding of how things work and how quick you pick that up. So if I pick it up really quick and get a good understanding, educate in education you know, you could actually turn, keep going within one year and, and keep improving. The problem is uh, with all my different trials and whatnot and, and, and a lack of understanding, I certainly went backwards for about two years. It really hurt me. But once I understood it, um, the, the direction, the growth is huge. So I've just got so much more confidence now in what we have actually seen and experienced um, that it doesn't need to take too long. However, I think in a cropping situation, um, it may take longer, but I'll leave Simon to answer that. But Simon, when you go look over his farm, uh, he, he's got his soils thriving, but that's over decades of work. But we are learning also, and Simon will say, with cover crops and different diverse species, how quickly they actually uh, recover the soil and turn things turn things around. So, Simon, did you want to speak to the cropping angle? Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm a. I'm the sort of person that likes to go. I wonder what would happen if I did this, um, and probably focus not enough on the bottom line when it comes to that sort of thing. But I think um, there are certainly lots of challenges around arable farming because you can't just pick up what's been done overseas and, and, and scale it to New Zealand um, on a broad acre basis. Um, I think generally a more biological, the, the more biological the approach in an arable situation, the more resilience you build into the system. I haven't seen a drop off in yield as such, but what we, we're really starting to see is a building of resilience um, around you know we're just not using any insecticides anymore and and uh, we're getting to the point where the fungicides are no longer uh, prevalent and it, it, it's actually vastly more complex in an arable system to, to get an understanding of all these individual facets so you know I've done a few spray-free trials with the likes of hybrid radish and had very good 
results, but it, it just takes the, the information is just not readily there to pick up and run with it. You've actually you've actually got to do a bit of trial and error as well, which can be, you know, it can cost you. But hey, I'm I'm life is for learning, and I'm still alive, so I still want to learn. Um, so that's actually the most important thing to me. I've probably got the most expensive education in New Zealand, I suspect. It's one way of looking at it, certainly. Um, Kay, I know you've got many, many years of education and experience too. Um, do you have any thoughts around how long it takes to turn around? We'd love to also hear your, um, there was a, a sort of a related question around how long it took to, um, and, and what was the, the method of, of getting your, your hum, humus levels up, um, humus levels up that you mentioned. And so I've learned bit by bit by bit, but I, I began, the way I began was by getting ream soil tests done and using fertiliser based on those soil tests. So I didn't go backwards, I only went forwards right from the beginning, but then I wanted to learn how to do it without buying fertiliser. I wanted to really create um, nutrient cycling. And so I've learned how to do it now without buying fertiliser. I mean, I'm talking about horticulture, I'm talking about annual cropping, really, and forest gardens, I've got different strategies, um, completely different strategies, but I'm using trees and fungi in the forest gardens and, and ramia wood chip. In the gardens, we're using ramia wood chip now too. But uh, So over the last 15 years, I've slowly gone from using soil tests, and I'm still doing the soil tests, but using fertiliser, and slowly I've learned how to make compost that actually grows food, hybrid food, and builds soil. And I've used a lot of um, biochar and clay as well in our sandy soils, and I've slowly learned how to use local materials and local things so that we don't have to buy the fertiliser. But I'm basing it all on... Um, um, the science that I've learned from um, all the people that are teaching biological agriculture. So understanding the principles is really important, but it's a journey. So I guess starting off using industrial fertiliser based on the ream soil test meant I went forwards rather than backwards in the beginning because I don't think I could have, I didn't have the knowledge or the experience in the beginning to immediately know how to make, I mean, I'd been making compost for many years, but it, the compost was not good enough to be growing Hybrix food. So I had to learn that. And I learned it by testing, doing, so I test every compost heap, I test the whole garden every six months. So I've done a lot of testing, I've learned a lot of science, and I've learned now how to do it much faster. <laughs> how to get there much faster. But you don't have to go backwards in an annual cropping situation, I don't think. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Mark, did you want to add anything there? Yes, yes, thanks. Um, so we've, we've had many drastic changes so, um, along this journey. So we've, we were a conventional dairy for we're nearly 26 years, 27 years. So um, I started to go down this path of Regen Ag probably uh, three years ago, um, but um, then started getting into this grazing two years ago. So, um, and just last year, we also went to once a day milking. So our cows are having to adapt to the once a day milking and, um, and the new systems of grazing and reducing and eliminating the toxic um, chemicals out of our system. So we're on a massive transition journey and I can see, you know, generally with once a day herds, it may take three to four years to get production back up to where, um, where is uh, a nice level. So we think complementing that with the regenerative grazing and the management, it it'd probably take us three to five years to have a full transition. But in saying that, we're already seeing um, increased soil carbon levels, so we're holding more water, um, we're increasing, increasing organic matter and the minerals in the soil are, are all increasing just under um, high stock density grazing. Um, so 
now that we can see the power in that, we can really start to restore our land. Um, we took on some ex-cropping land as well six years ago. Um, so we're doing a lot of this. Um, this will be our first year away from no beer soil. So this was another um, leap of faith. <laughs> so we're doing, we're, we're intensely bale grazing on this ex-cropping land to try and get carbon back in the soil and get the microbiology happening again with, um, with the cows. Yeah, so, so it's a journey. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. And step by step, it's great to hear you. You're getting some results in no bare ground this year. Um, there's a question here, and I know a couple of you have spoken into it already around um, being not not purists um, when it comes to the complete organics. But Rebecca Wright has got a question: What is the place of glyphosate herbicides in regenerative no-till systems? Can you be regenerative and still use herbicide on a large scale? And how do the different panelists view this? Um, well, seeing it, oh, sorry, Hamish, you go. Oh, right. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the, this is one of the most sort of um, biggest topics discussed, even amongst us regenerative farmers. So uh, we don't take it lightly. But what I'd like to say to people is I'd rather have 40% of farmers start practicing regenerative management than 5% farmers being organic and not using glyphosate or tools that get us to where we want to go. So Simon's the same. He doesn't like to use glyphosate. I don't, or Mark don't like using glyphosate, but it is a tool to get us to where we want to go in our transition. And the key that I want to get across to people is where you're heading, a trajectory. And I hope in 10 years, five to 10 years, I won't need to use it. I think it may be banned within 10 years. So we have to start thinking about how we're gonna use it. But let me please make this clear. If we don't have glyphosate, then we have to go back till, tilling the soil, which can be just as de degrading. So I'm not, I think cropping ha has some real challenges. I think in, in the livestock, sheep and beef and dairy, we can get away with it quite easily in the near future without having to use glyphosate or even tilling our ground, just with really good grazing management and, and strategies. Um, but please um, be patient with us in, in our transitions. And also, I think as the science comes to the fore, um, I'm not saying yes or no how bad it is. I've seen both sides of the story, but I'm open, but I'm also working positively towards not having to rely on it. Over to you, Simon. <laughs> Thanks, Hamish. I couldn't have put it better myself. But um, I, um, we're, uh, I think in an, in an arable situation where you traditionally use a lot of chemical, um, we're looking at strategies that we can do to eliminate um, or mitigate. So uh, eliminate, reduce, or mitigate, or mitigate and reduce. And I think glyphosate's classic. Um, I use three litres of glyphosate or a kilogram of active ingredient per hectare instead of probably 100 litres of diesel per hectare. Now, I think if I was challenged to a drinking race, I'd rather drink a litre of three, you know, a kilo of glyphosate than 100 litres of diesel. But anyway, that's a bit silly. But um, the, the point is our mitigation for, for glyphosate is to use fish hydrolysate with it or fulvic acid, which... Um, is a microbial, both microbial feeders, which sort of buffer some of the negative effects on the soil biota, but also achieve the, you know, achieve the result. So we're mindful of these things, but where there's no established practice in terms of elimination, and we're working on that, um, I will not go back to cultivation because that is the, the most destructive thing that you can do to soil, hands down. Um, and so therefore, me, for me, I've just got to find a way forward. And, and we're working on, interestingly, cover crops. There's huge possibilities uh, using, um, does, you know, a mix of species designed for the particular following crop with the correct winter grazing. I think it's, it's going to be possible to move beyond glyphosate in the future, but there's an awful lot of work to do to just establish 
to st- establish a, a, a you know a mode of practice around that that's successful. Yeah, certainly a very complex and, and nuanced issue there. And um, I, I liked what you said, Hamish, about you know rather having forty percent of farmers on the right right trajectory and at least a, a big movement of people going that way. Um, I'd like to change tack a little quickly now. And there's been a question here from Jennifer Nicol. Um, around asking if there are any examples of multi-strata agroforestry, tree intercropping and silver pasture in New Zealand that we can learn from in this context. And Kay, I know that you have been um, doing a lot with introducing um, some uh, yeah, silver pasture on, on your farm. So would you like to talk about that? Sure. Yeah, that's, I mean... I mean, trees, uh, trees and plants, but especially trees, are the mineral cyclers of the planet. Like, we've wiped a lot of them off, but bringing them back is going to be, for sure, one of the key answers. Um, I'm really excited about our chicken and pig forage paddock, where we've got, um, right from when the early berries and fruits start ripening, right through to when the acorns and the chestnuts and the, all the nuts fall. We've got, like, we're raising pigs. We have, you've got to have the right breeds, of course, but... Um, Without any other, without any industrial food, and eggs, egg production is a is one of the hardest ones. Like non industrial like regenerative egg production is a really big challenge. We're doing that on a small scale, but and then for um, a cat, for I mean, we're actually in, integrating annual crop production, um, dairy production, pork production and egg production all into tree systems or tree systems into all of those systems because that's where the mineral cycling comes from and it yeah that's it's really really exciting integrating on land use um it's a very very new field exciting journey and i mean it <laughs> Uh, that last question about the glyphosate, in, in a way, like it becomes a very personal journey, this, this whole thing. And it's such an exciting journey because you start to see that, that you're creating living systems and you're bringing back the life. You're starting to see regeneration happening in ecologies around us. And we're all learning in a slightly different way and from slightly different things. And so you can't make judgments about anything, really. Everyone has their own journey. And as long as we're all moving forward, like that's, the only important thing and so supporting each other to find you know to find our own way forward is the best we can do i think and trees have got to be the trees are perennial are the i mean we're we grow all of our own food and so learning which are the perennials are much easier than annuals and so like how to use acorns and chestnuts and Trees are such an important part of it, yeah, and integrating them with animal systems and with gardening systems. We are planting um, poplars and willows and alders around our gardens and coppicing them on a regular, some annually, some biannually, some try uh, every three years to produce ramia wood chip. And that's now our fertilizer because it's got balanced minerals and nutrients and it feeds the fungi, which really feeds everything. So. There's lots of amazing new ideas coming through for incorporating and integrating tree systems and perennial systems into all of our animal systems and food production systems. Yeah. That was beautifully put. I think everybody's on their own on their own path. Um, anybody else like to uh, comment on silver pasture or agroforestry? Otherwise, um, we've got a question around inputs that I'd like to go to. Uh, I'll just quickly comment on the silver pasture. Um, we just are so excited about getting into more of this um, as we go over the next probably decade or two. I mean, this, this is a long game. This is no quick fix, but um, we see so much potential in that. And there's enough farmers, I think, around New Zealand that if you search it out, you'll find them doing some really amazing examples. Um, I just want to get, say the Billion Trees Fund. We would love to be part of that, but if we fence off our gullies and we want to plant natives we have to plant just natives but we want to plant fruit trees and um and timber trees as well but we're disqualified um you get fifteen hundred dollars a hectare to plant pine so it's just easier to go plant pines there is no incentive whatsoever for us to think laterally laterally about um different ways of planting trees and until that changes we are just limiting the innovation about what we can do for the future. The government is far too 
um, narrow in their thinking for there to be huge progress. Yeah, fantastic points there, Hamish. Thank you. Um, there's a question here from uh, Thrani Prakash um, around how do the costs of inputs in regenerative agricultural practices um, used by the panelists compare to those of conventional industrial agriculture? Are the inputs used completely natural or do you have additional other um, costs there? I, th I think in the, in the transition phase um, where you're using both conventional and biological inputs, it can probably creep you can probably get a bit of cost creep, uh, certainly in the arable sense. But as we learn, um, I mean, there's you know things like fish hydrolysate, which mostly feed the soil, and then as you build the soil, it then feeds the plants. Um, we're using. Uh, I've reduced my rates of fertilizer dr pretty dramatically. We don't use any. Uh, I think for, for me, it's looking at what are you short of. And what do you need to do? And and I think with conventional ag over the years, we've mined out all the trace elements by putting on loads and loads of, of you know NPK and S, and um, you know it's more about calcium and trace elements now. Um, and small quantities of trace elements are reasonably cost effective, and we're we're not seeing any drop in production. In fact, still using a conventional soil test, our uh, you know. Got the, the Olsen P levels have gone up massively since I stopped putting on fertilizer, so I'm not quite sure what that tells you that the biological function is oh, coming in. Did you have something there that you wanted to add, Kat? Oh, that shows them the biology is working, so that's awesome. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I don't think, um, in terms of costs, I, I think there's a bit of a paradigm shift around the way we look at it. I don't think it's about production per hectare anymore, it's about profit per hectare. Because um, you can have less production, but a lot less costs, and you end up with more profit, and it works better. So there's a lots of different ways of looking at it. In terms of the annual cropping, you can say, okay, keep your budget the same, and... Um, get better production but then over time switch to more i mean i think for me the journey of a lot of people will start and i started by just switching to an to a biological version of what well i never used the chemical version in the beginning but i used the organic version and there's actually a difference between a certified organic version and a biological version and to me the biological now is like the most important um but then you can switch from there to doing it more locally and more regionally using different strategies and different techniques. You've just got to take the time to learn what works best. Yeah, I think, I think the key thing there, Kay, you hit the nail on the head with the, you know, it's, it's the net profit. It's not, it's not the total amount you produce. It's what you put in your pocket at the end of it. That's most important. And, and, you know, con conventional ag is all about, maximizing production because if you, yeah yeah but if you maximize production you maximize the downstream profit for all the downstream industries you don't make any more for the farmer in fact you usually make less because you're stuffing your asset in the meantime yeah and um just on that i, I mean i'll be similar to mark here you know we've increased our carrying capacity 25 percent we've actually dropped our costs from say 50 percent being the industry average down to 30 percent uh, three years ago we actually just stopped putting on fertilizer full stop and we because once we understood our grazing we now have higher stock densities we go into taller pasture covers and now we we say eat a third trample a third and leave a third so we're not now putting on fertilizer we're now fertilizing and it's a really big difference we're not just changing our short grazing and carrying on not putting fertilizer on we are our grazing management is very very focused to say put down 30 percent of what we grow back onto the soil and it's making a compost and i'm sharing the same results as mark as simon and as Kay. our fertility levels in our soil and our herbages are either going up or staying the same it's remarkable. So I'm not here to be validated by science in that field. I'm waiting for the science to catch up and validate what we're doing and start <laughs> to understand what is going on here. And, and they have to start to ask the same sorts of questions and be just as inquisitive as farmers are. 
Yeah, love it. Um, yeah, you, yeah, I think you the, want to the, respond there, Simon? Sorry, I just think the economic argument is probably the easiest argument to make for regenerative ag, actually. Um, you know, you, you're doing it with animals. Our, our fertiliser is all about cover crops and then incorporating grazing as well. Um, so it's, yeah, it's getting that biological function, leveraging your strengths, and that's, that's where it comes in. I mean, before I stopped using fertiliser, I, I sent some soil samples off to Australia and said, well, what, what, what's the total amount of minerals that we have in the soil? And we have two tonnes of bioachievable phosphate per hectare. So why the hell would I put on any more phosphate? I've got enough there to last me to, you know, goodness knows when. And, you know, it's the same with potassium and, and you know, sulfur and, or, or, you know, the one thing we were short of is calcium. And, I, you know, I think the, the other, the other, the high analysis fertilizer and the, and the agrochemicals leach, leach calcium out of the soil. Mm. We had a good conversation last week around the, um, the, the market mechanisms and, and what New Zealand might be able to achieve with premium products if we had a good standard in place um, for this kind of stuff. Um, you, as you were speaking there, Hamish, it, um, it uh, yeah, reminded me of a question that has come through in the registration that I, is one that comes up a lot that I hear as I've been researching this series and talking to people and, and, and the issue in New Zealand that a lot of farmers think that what they do in New Zealand already is regenerative because we have cows on pasture or, or animals on pasture year round. So the question is, what, what differentiates regenerative agriculture from a non-nitrogen using rotationally grazed high performing sheep and beef farm that has a comprehensive farm and environment plan? Okay, I'll start off. And actually, Mark, do you want to go? Yeah, yeah. So, so what we're seeing um, with adopting these the soil health principles, the five principles. Um, we're, we're now not sending our soil out to the ocean. New Zealand loses around 200 million tonnes of soil per year. Attached to that's phosphate and goodness knows what else. So adopting these soil health principles has really um, excelled our business. Um, and that's it's certainly moving us to another level. Um, what was the mm. question? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess the question is really um, if if you are not using nitrogen and you're rotationally grazing, uh, and yes. you've got a comprehensive farm environment plan, is that is that regenerative or what what are, what's the difference in your eyes? Yeah, I guess I guess you'd have to ask yourself the question is importing tons of palm kernel regenerative is, is, is adding um, petrochemicals to your land regenerative. Um, oh, the, the list is endless. Um, we've got so many resources on our land, whether that's wood chips for composting or recyclable materials. Um, that we could be using out of other industries or just returning food waste back to the land. Um, we waste like 40% of food produced. So yeah, the, these mm. things could all be regenerating back into the land. Yeah, absolutely. And Mark, while we're speaking with you, there's a specific question for you from Thomas. Um, how do you test your soil to check how much organic matter you've got there? So, so I'd recommend taking a soil food web test to see if your soil is a fungal or, or bacterial dominated, um, and then that kind of gives you a bit of a a bit of an idea of of where you need to go. Um, we're taking soil samples now to fifteen centimeters, so not the standard seventy five, um, um, uh, seven point five. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, yeah, we're still soil testing through hills to get baseline data. Um, and we're also involved in another program um, with Gwen Grillet and her team measuring soil carbon down to one metre, taking one metre core samples. Um, yeah, so that's, that's where we're at. 
I'll just to say a word here. Um, so four years ago, when I was um, confronted by Dr. Christine Jones at a seminar, and I fought with her all day about how wrong she was. How can this Australian woman from Australia come and tell us how to farm over here? Um, I see sort of a lot of that same attitude coming out now. It's very defensive. So I was very defensive and I didn't like to be told. I thought I was sustainable. After the end of the day, she wore me down. So I went and actually did some investigation and some, some research for myself. And I, I started to understand some of the management practices that I was doing was not um, improving or building my soil or building um, non-renewable resources. And it just comes down to just be honest with yourself and ask the questions, is this degrading our environment? Is it degrading natural resources or is it building? And once you're open to that, then you start the journey. It's a, it's a mindset. To me, it's a mindset. Um, not trying to defend, um, look, most of New Zealand farmers could well be regenerative. I mean, who am I to say? But I knew that I wasn't and that journey of understanding, you know, I learned more from ecologists than I have from agricultural scientists a lot of the time. And going back to what Mark said, the, the five principles of soil health is what basically is the foundation of what our um, business is built on. So no bare soil, living roots in the ground, diverse species, animal impact. Um, so we need animals in our environment, um, you know, in broad acres, I mean, Kay's a different story. Um, she still has chooks and pigs, so that's awesome. But it's a combination of everything. And we need more trees. Um, we get that. But it's a, it's a mindset of understanding and just being open to what we need to improve on. Yeah, I, I, I have no idea how much of New Zealand agriculture is regenerative. Like, I agree with Hamish on that one. And it, and it it doesn't much matter what I think on that scene, but uh, you know, it's the it's the frontier of opportunity at the moment. What it, you know, we, we've sort of reached an impasse in agriculture where globally, agricultural incomes for people who are farmers are dropping and have dropped for the last fifty years, and the green revolution is not about empowering or enriching farmers. It's about empowering and enriching industry, and you know. Leveraging off our biological capacity is the last, well, it's, it's a great frontier that we have and, it, and the potential is endless. I mean, I've, in the arable scene, I've only scratched the surface really and I just, I just see so much potential. What I lack is the experience to know how to, to, to harness that, but I'm learning quickly. And, I, you know, I think now that we, we're, we're sort of talking amongst the people who are interested in this sort of thing, that we're learning even more quickly still. And... Uh, the, the potential is huge. It's just huge. And, you know, empowering farmers to have a culture of life around their farms and you start seeing things differently. And it actually makes the whole farming experience really enjoyable. And it just makes you realize how privileged you are to live here and, and to be doing, to be doing this. And, you know, I didn't have that attitude 10 years ago. I was actually feeling pretty worn out and bedraggled by it all. Cause we were just pouring more and more crap onto our farms and, and making less and less money. And, uh, you know, it just, that's, that's a hiding to nothing. Mm. We're having a conversation two weeks from tonight, I believe, with, um, with John O'Fru and uh, Sam Lang about the community and, and the, the mental health elements of regenerative agriculture. So that's going to be a great conversation to dive into as well. Um, we're about four minutes from the end here, so I think we've probably got time for, for one more quick question. Um, I think, um, yeah, let's, well, let's give an opportunity for anybody else to answer that question around, you know, for those who have grown up around conventional farming systems, um, do you have any other advice around how they can advocate for um, regenerative farmers for those around them, perhaps their neighbours that are still very much entrenched in those conventional systems. Anybody else wanted to chat on that? Well, or we well, I just, I just, it's it's about curiosity and and getting farmers reconnected with their farms, um, and and having a curiosity to learn and and having that 
that wonderment of nature. Um, you know, go out and dig a hole. D digging holes in your farm is one of the best ways to reconnect with your soil because you learn all sorts of really interesting stuff and you observe what's going on under the ground. What's going on above the ground is only, it's already too late. It's what's going on under the ground that you've, you've, you've got to use. And, and it, it's just about curiosity and learning. Making decisions which creates regeneration in your environment is such a deeply, profoundly, like, exciting and inspiring and, in a way, peaceful thing that you can't help but if other people see it and they feel it, it's, like, tangibly feelable. When you, like, plant trees and things that flower and they bring the insects and the insects bring the birds, the whole ecology starts changing. And it's, like... As human beings, we've co-evolved in systems like that that are incredibly diverse and connected, and it's in us, it's totally in us on a cellular level that that is the way we've always been, and we've disconnected ourselves in this industrial process of um, degeneration, and starting to reconnect again is so powerful, and it's so exciting, and other people get to see it and feel it. So all these farmers and all of us that are doing it now we're the beginning of like the research centers and the, and the models for others around us. And it just happens. But we, we definitely need like a lot more support from the government and planners and investors to take it further faster. Mm. Good point there. And we'll be having a, a conversation um, later on in the series too around investing and, and how we can uh, have financial incentives to encourage more people into this. Um, I think we're going to have to cut it off there. Um, thank you all so much this evening um, for speaking with us. And thank you to all of our panelists for joining us. Um, really thrilled with the momentum that's um, being gained around this series. Um, so we have got another session coming up um, Next week, it will be at lunchtime at noon next Monday's session. And I believe Ursula is going to put up a slide in a moment here that should have the details on there. You can also find out the, that information at pureadvantage.org, um, all the details of the webinars. Um, again, just wanted to uh, remind you that applications for cohort Eight of Edmonton Fellowship, who are co-producers of this series, is closing on the 1st of June, so last chance to um, apply for that. Um, you can see, yeah, we've got Nicole Masters and Dr. Gwen Grillet next week. Um, the following week, we have got uh, the community and mental health session that I mentioned. Um, later on, we have lessons from around the world with several people, and then the investment session that I just mentioned, and some exciting stuff going on there as well. Um, thank you all again for coming. Um, this, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we'll be um, answering some more of these questions on social media on the Pure Advantage pages on Instagram and Facebook. Um, Edmund Henry Fellowship you can also find um, on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, lots of exciting stuff coming up. Um, so please keep an eye out on your inboxes for invitations to the next call. Um, thank you again all for coming. It's been a wonderfully rich discussion and I hope you have all enjoyed it. Thank you again to all our panelists and we will see you all again very soon. <laughs>